as we, as we get, just before we get into to today's lesson, uh, we've been asking a few, a few different questions. Um, how is the, the lesson, the previous lesson, how is it impacting your life? How is it um, coming up against the things, the everyday things in life? And, and um, how, is, how is God's Word changing that? So, the, the first question is, what are, what are the ways that we can purposely de- declare Christ as we meet physical needs? As people have physical needs, they're around us. And so, uh, just, just picture this for a moment, maybe. Um, uh, maybe you're made aware of, of, of a situation that maybe your neighbor is sick, um, has no one, and you're it. Uh, no one to look after them, no one to manage their household, uh, let alone someone to talk to. So how do you purposely, and they're not a believer, how do you purposely declare Christ as we meet physical needs in this situation? Any thoughts? As we're going through these lessons, these lessons, the, the Word of God should be able to impact us, should teach us. And so how do we purposefully declare Christ as we meet physical needs? Any thoughts? Because hasn't, isn't that been part of the issue with, say, the MCC, which is more about meeting physical needs, and that's the end of story, Right. And so our tension, our challenge as a church is that there's got to be something more to this. Okay, so now let's put feet to it. So it's one thing to kind of critique over there, but what does that look like Mm -hmm. where we live? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Putting their needs before our own. Selflessness, right? What other ways do we communicate or declare Christ as we're meeting these physical needs, as we're as we're going, um, as we're we're reaching out to those people that are that are in need, in desperate need, essentially? Sometimes on the job, when you go to make an extra effort to to do a perfect job or to take extra time and do it in some of the ways that we think that it's it's beneficial for everybody, somebody may ask a question. Ah, isn't that the truth? It's, it's, allow, it's doing things well, creating opportunity, right? Creating opportunity for conversation. Why would you take so much time to do that? You get paid either way. Very good. Any other thoughts? Absolutely. So then do we as believers, do we prepare each day recognizing the opportunities that might be in front of us? Does that influence how we pray? Does that influence how we read God's Word? Does that influence how we engage with Him? Or should it? I'm just asking the question. It's interesting. I've, I've shared, I, I've shared a, a couple of different situations. I, I don't know if in, in this setting necessarily, but in, in the church setting, obviously, for sure, I, I know I have. But you know, <clears throat> there was uh, I, it, it was winter time. Uh, it was actually getting very close to Christmas. Uh, m- my family, we were we were out, Pat and I, and the kids. We were out shopping at Walmart, and somebody came up to us and they said, <clears throat> and, and it's a lady. 
uh, a young lady, and she's, she's cold, and she's asking. You could feel it. Like her, the cold was radiating off her. Like it was really cold outside, and so she must have just come in, and the cold was really radiating off her jacket. And she said, do you know where the nearest uh, uh, mechanics garage is or whatever? And, and, so, <coughs> and so I said, well, you know, here, here, and here. And uh, walked off and went on my merry way, and all of a sudden it hit me. There was a need there. She's cold. Chances are she is in a crisis right now. Her vehicle has a problem, and you just gave her direction. You had an opportunity to help her out and, 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 and possibly even speak into her life. And what did I do? I walked away. And so I turned, we had walked halfway down or right across the, the, the Walmart store, and I looked at Pat and I said, we've got to go find that lady because she obviously needs help. And we walked away. And so we walked back and, and we looked and we looked and we couldn't find her anywhere. So I, that's a situation. You know, I pray in the morning. This, you know, this is, what we, this is what I do. I, I'm not going to say we. This is what I do. I pray in the morning. God, use me. Oh, you know, the spiritual prayer. Use me, Lord. And, 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 and yet when God puts somebody in there, what do I do? Well, we're shopping. We're, you know, it's Christmas time. We're shopping. You're cold. You know, move on. But this is the perfect opportunity what are, what are ways that we declare Christ by meeting physical needs? Now we put away our schedule, our busy schedule, and we say, hey, yeah, can I, can I help you? Can we walk with you? Um, fortunately, God is gracious to us. He, he teaches us and He continues to teach us. And I've shared also about this story in Vegas at the car show. And I wind up, I, I won't go into all the details because Dave's looking at me like, get on, get on with it already because we've got to get in a lesson. But, but I wind up with, on this, on this pellet in the floor, there's 100,000 people scattered around this whole building, and I wind up on this pellet beside this, this floor, and we start talking with this lady, this, this young girl, and, and she had just become a Christian two weeks prior to that, and uh, <clears throat> she, she ends up telling, telling us, and, and so I just, and she had some struggles. She says, I just, oh, I'm trying so hard. I said, you know, I don't want to lose this. And there was that opportunity. So right there, and, and I'm not a quiet guy, and when I, get, when I talk about Jesus, I can't help but get louder and louder. And so there we are in the middle of this thing, and I'm talking about Jesus. I'm declaring Jesus to these people that, you know, in, in this place that has a physical... And people would stop, and they would stare, and there was some people from work, and they were uncomfortable. Some of them walked away, but some of them talked to me later, and they said, they said that was powerful. That was just... It spoke to my heart, and so it reached out to them as well. And so... Those are things we meet physical needs. We pray these prayers, but how do we, how do we, you know, God keep me sensitive to the need, to the person, to the to the request that's right before us. Okay, I, I'm not gonna. I'm done with my stories now. Go ahead. Let's jump into tonight's lesson. Authentic faith unites. So as disciples of Christ. We follow him alone. And that's the, that's the truth as we've been going through God's word. God is a relationship. God pursues relationship, right? And just as we come to faith in Christ, God's pursuit of us doesn't, doesn't suddenly end. We're now one with him. There's an intimacy. There's a relationship that goes forward. And so as a result of that, our lives take on a focus and takes on a passion that infuses every part of us. This focus and this passion is actually originates from God as He lives His life out through us and that we take on that dynamicness through Him. It comes directly through God the Holy Spirit. This is His transforming work. And as a result of that, He leads us to increasingly worship Him in all of life, be transformed by Him in all of life, desire to obey Him in all of life, and teach others to do the same. And that's the incredible nature of this relationship. We're not in this journey alone, are we? We're in, this, we're in this union, this relationship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords where He comes to indwell us by His Spirit. And so as a result of that, this transforming work by God the Holy Spirit is His passions become ours. His motivations become ours. His thinking becomes ours. His joy becomes ours and devotion to worship God through, the serv through serving in prayer. All of those things, as we've been looking through the book of Acts, those become ours. It's not do better, try harder. This is this relationship that he draws us into. So let's just stop quickly. So what are the, what are the passions of our God? What would you say are passion? Let's go off script here for a second. But what are the passions of our God? What are those passions that he's going to instill in us? What should we be expecting? What should we be expecting? 
Thoughts? How about a passion for His Word? Is there not going to be, as we're, as we're walking with Him, should there not be a growing passion for His Word? And where does that passion come from? Or if there's lack of passion, what do we do? Would we beat ourselves up in the process? Or, or what's our response? Because we all wane in our walk with the Lord, don't we? There's ups and downs in all of our journey. Isn't it a matter of just coming back and saying, God, humbly, God, and, re- and re-engaging with Him? <coughs> what other passions would be His? For his glory, right? A deep, love for other people. a deep love for other people. Because, again, everybody's created in his image, right? And so love of other people is love for God. His motivations become ours. His transformation, this transformation as he lives his life out through us, is this abundant life in Christ that he's come to give us. And that's really what it is. It's this Christ's life through us where all of these characteristics come through. How thankful are you that you're not on your own in this journey through life. Like, where would we be if we didn't have a God who indwelt us, transforming us, and giving us a passion for Him and His Word? Jesus is our everything, and He provides everything. He transforms our lives and gives us an an absolute, unshakable confidence that carries us forward. Do we as believers, and sometimes, you know, it's just really good just to step back for a second and just remember again all that we have in Christ. He didn't just come to deal with our past, did He? He came to provide us with a, with a present and also a future. And going forward, seeing all that He is and all that He's provided for us. You want to keep going, Gary? Yeah. So in the book of Acts, we see God the Holy Spirit empowering the apostles to advance the church, to further the church. And the result of that, the result of God, the Holy Spirit, empowering the apostles, what happens? The result is that thousands believed. So the apostles are thrown into jail. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're brought before the, the religious court. But instead of being frightened, the Holy Spirit gave them courage and filled them with wisdom. So he's empowering them. You, and, and you remember, previous to this, as we go back into the Gospels, there was a heart of what? There was a heart of fear. There was a heart of running away. Now they're empowered by God the Holy Spirit. And so now they have courage. They're, they're filled with wisdom. And, and they're moving forward. But while the apostles might have walked away rejoicing for being persecuted, being whipped for Christ, think about what this means. So, so these are the apostles... Now, they've just been teaching, they, they, they've just been, you know, they've been a part of this, this whole baptism, the church, boom, you know, 3,000 people, uh, it, it, it just explodes onto the scene. But think about these new believers now, right in front of them, what is happening? Your leaders, these people that, that led you to Christ, that pointed you to Christ, that, that preached this message that God used to, you know, meet them, you know, just grind into their soul and bring conviction on their lives and then to cause them to say what must we do and the, and the and the apostles say repent and be baptized and so they do well now their leaders are they're being hauled off into court they're being thrown into prison uh, being whipped like jesus had then they just seen this a few months ago so what are you thinking you just experienced some incredible things in your own personal life. Now these teachers, these leaders, what's going on in your life? What do you think they were considering? Or or were they considering things like, what about my wife? What happens to my kids in all of this? Do you think there was any fear? What is it going to cost me? Do you think that was what was going through their heads? What do you think your unsafe family members would be saying? Hmm. So how did God the Holy Spirit move in these difficult, challenging days of the early church? Here's where God's Word will take us this evening. So we're going to look at authentic faith unites. 
And it does so in God-focused prayer, in radical, selfless, holy lives. So the question is, we're talking about authentic, authentic faith. What is authentic faith? So it's a faith that looks outside of ourselves to put our trust in the one who is secure, faithful, and trustworthy. This is not about believing harder. This is not having faith in faith. This is not about uh, really truly believing. Actually, faith is an action where, where, we, where we look and we, we rely on the strength of another. So here's an illustration, just to use an illustration. The story is told of a great tightrope walker who stretched a 1,300-foot rope across Niagara Falls. And in front of this, ama- and the, the crowds were absolutely amazed as they watched him walk forwards and backwards, running across it. He even cooked a meal out in the middle of the, middle of the rope at one particular point. But only one person was willing to put their faith in the tightrope walker. That was the manager. The manager of the tightrope walker, he alone consented to being piggybacked across that 1,300 swaying rope across Niagara Falls. Nobody else would put it on, put their life on the line in that particular way. See, this is what authentic faith looks like. This is what it looks like in the apostles in the early church. They were all in on this. They put everything on the line, risking everything. So one of the apostles later in, in, in 2 Timothy 2, verses 12, he put it this way, I know whom I trust, and I am sure, convinced, that he is able to guard which I have entrusted to him to, um, until the day of his return. This is where the early church was at in their faith. This is all that they had, this authentic, authentic faith. So notice what happens as the apostles leave the courtroom. courtroom. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. And go to verse 23. Acts chapter 4, verse 23. And uh, once you have it, somebody uh, somebody read that for us, please. Where's your Bible? So how did, Peter and Rejo- uh, how did Peter and John respond here from this verse? On their release, Peter and John, how did they respond? They went home to their families, right? They didn't go back to doing what they were doing before. Yeah, they went right back. They joined the other believers. They went right back into the ministry that Jesus commanded them. Why? Why would you do this? You just went through this. Go home to your family. Make sure they're okay. Get out of this business of persecution. No, they go back to the, these people, to the believers, back to the ministry that God had commanded them to. Why? Why do they do that? Because they needed to report They wanted to report and communicate to everybody, to their church, what was going on. They were accountable to their their church body. And the believers could have been standing by wondering and praying for their leaders during the trial and torture. And so, uh, you know, they want to know what's going on. We've been praying for you. We're concerned for you. What happened in all of this? And what it does is it reveals, it reveals the relationship, this close community that they enjoyed with each other with each other. And one thing I find really interesting is, and the reason I find this interesting is because I'm, I'm, man, I, my, my fleshly thinking is always opposite here. The apostles didn't hide the details, you know, from the new believers, you know, you guys are new believers. We're not going to tell you that we were in court because it might cause you to walk away from Jesus. So we're not going to tell you about that. What do they do? They go and report. They wanted these new believers to know exactly what happened. That we went, you know, man, we went through some persecution. You know what my mind says? My mind says, protect them. They're going to run away. But they didn't. They were all in. They were all together. What one member felt, what, what, what these guys went through what, in the persecution, the church felt, these new believers, they felt. So sometimes when we read this passage, I don't know about you guys, when I read this verse 23, how big do you think this group is? 
Like you get a sense when you read it, verse 23, on the release, Peter and John went back to their own people, their own people. How many, how many do you think that was? 120 plus. Yeah, 120 plus. But the reality is, how big is the church at this point in time? 5, yeah, yeah, 5,000 plus. Now, we don't know how many of them stayed in Jerusalem because they came, a number of them came from 11 different countries. But this was no small gathering of believers. So now think about that in our situation. If all of a sudden our pastor here got hauled into court, he's been beat up and, and kicked around, now he's coming back, what are, what, what are we going to do? We'll probably break into small groups, right? Talking, okay, what's going on? Would we maybe start criticizing our pastor if, if only they had done this or if they only had done that? But let's see what they actually did, verses 24 to 28. When they heard this, who's they? Who's they here? The, the believers, right? So when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, um, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Pharaoh and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. So how did they respond? How did these believers respond? Prayed, Prayed right? What kind of prayer? Broke into small groups, right? one over here, one over there? What's it, what's it, what's it say there? Verse 24. Together. Together. Um, Eva, where are you? You have the King James. Can you read, the, read, read verse 24 in the King James for me, please? With one accord, united. This was one voice. This is, this is, they are united in God-focused prayer as they're uniting together. This was one, one mind, one heart, one plea. This is their level of unity. This is their level of confidence in who God was. So why would the believers, these are newer believers, this is, just a, this is just a few years in on this, on this journey here. If we look at the timeline, they're only probably believers maybe of five years roughly. So why would they be praying like this? What does this reveal about them? What's their confidence? Where is their confidence? What's their reveal? First thing they thought of was the Lord. Yeah. They didn't look at the court. They looked at the opportunity to proclaim Christ, didn't they? Go to the next screen, please, Gary. Oh, is it missing? One missing? Yeah. Okay, excuse me. They had, confident, they had confidence in God as almighty, sovereign and present, right? They had confidence in, in what God declared through his prophets. Like, notice, notice what they're quoting there in verse, in verse 25 onward. They're quoting from the Old Testament scriptures what God had declared. They had confidence in God completing His plan. No one could thwart it. So they weren't overwhelmed by this turn of events, were they? They saw God moving His plan forward, and they had confidence in Jesus as God the Son and their soul deliverer. So what's fascinating is how they prayed. This was a concert of prayer with incredible harmony and unity, wasn't there? And they saw God's sovereignty in the midst of their persecution and their, and their suffering. Think about this. This is evidence in who they knew who their God was, right? They knew that their God was so much bigger than the circumstances that they're walking through, that God had a purpose and a plan that He was going to accomplish. They knew that they had no one else who could provide going forward. Keep going, Gary. So how does such a young church, people who are new to the faith, how do they respond this way? Isn't that interesting? 
But what it is, is it gives evidence of their confidence in God. Their confidence in, in the ability of who God is as, their, uh, as every, their everything, dependency on God, their complete and total dependency on God, and understanding of God. So notice what their faith in God leads them to ask for in Acts 4, 29-31. Acts 4, and then starting at verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Who are they talking to? What are they doing? Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. This is their prayer, right? Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. So what is their response? Do they, do they run off and, 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 and find a quiet room somewhere and hide? Do they cower in fear? You know, How do we get out of here? How do we get out of this situation? No, they don't. What is their prayer? Isn't it crazy? They ask God to make them bolder in their witness for signs and wonders through the name of Jesus. They want people to know more about Jesus. Give us boldness in light of this persecution, in light of this, what we're going on here. Give us boldness in that. Reveal yourself. Show yourself by your signs and wonder. They weren't retreating. They weren't, they weren't cowering or looking for an escape. They were all in. They were sold. They were, we talked about this. This is, this is confidence in God so much so that, that you're willing to bet everything. You're willing to lay everything on it. That you're willing to go through persecution for this God because you know that He is the only one that can provide for you what is actually needed. And that's the provision of eternal life at the end. Look how God answered their prayer in this. Uh, let, let's go back. Uh, what verse is this here? Uh, 31. 31. After 31. Read the, read, let's read 31 again. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the Word of God boldly. He shook the place where they were meeting. Why did He shake the place? Why would He do that? Is that just, like, just for uh, you know, good effect? Ambience? <laughs> He shook the place where they were meeting to assure them, assure them that he had heard their prayer. I, God, have heard your prayer. And then he filled them with the Holy Spirit to enable them to speak boldly about Christ. Just as they had asked him to. Just as they had prayed. God, help us to speak boldly. Isn't that incredible? So what would it have been like to be in that prayer meeting? Oh, yeah. What, yeah. Do you th- what do you think it sounded like? What do you think it looked like? Can that, you... That's an interesting question. What, it, what did it look like? Sometimes we... Do we think it was a... Remember, this is a, these are new believers. Sometimes we think that, that the prayer meeting has to be these you know, well-rehearsed, uh, you know, 14-minute lead into the, the actual <laughs> prayer of nice, elegant, you know, spiritual wording? Do you think that's what it was? These are new believers. Do you think there was weeping and crying? Do you think some of them were flat on their face? Oh. This is their lives on the line, right? And it's all one accord. There's incredible unity here, isn't there? What do you think it felt like to have the room, sh- room shake? Anybody else felt an earthquake before? It's an incredible, it's, a, it's kind of a weird feeling. Until you first, it kind of, sets you, uh, kind of sets you back a minute to, okay, what's, what's happening here? Is it just my head or, or is it actually, and then you start to see either the water juggling or moving in a cup or whatever, and you realize you're in the middle of an earthquake. But imagine what that, what that would be like. And do sen- you sense their boldness in the Lord? And what would it be like to be filled with the Spirit? What did that look like? Any thoughts? What do you think that looked like to be filled with the Spirit? 
Was this another baptism? Just like in Acts chapter 2? Is that what this was? Or what's taking place here? Any thoughts? Did they get more of the Holy Spirit at this, mo at this moment? A little bit of a review from last week. Dan kind of talked on this. Did they get more of the Holy Spirit? Oh, Dan, you better come back up and reteach this point here. Yeah, <laughs> no, they weren't. No, they didn't get more of the Holy Spirit. They got all of the Holy Spirit at the moment of their, of their rescue, didn't they? But what took place was, they they, what took place was, this is an outpouring of God's power in their lives to meet a specific need and to advance God's kingdom. This is what God is doing in their lives. This was an empowerment. This was a, a moving of the Spirit to enable them to go forward. This feeling was in response to their faith and submission to God's plan, regardless of the cost. The Holy Spirit then enabled them to overcome fear to preach with great effect. And through the Holy Spirit, they, stayed, they stared persecution death in the face to boldly declare who Christ was. They asked Christ to increase their faith. This was authentic Holy Spirit-inspired faith. This is what authentic faith looks like as you go forward. And here's the question. Is that available for us today as believers? Or is it only for the new church, early church, right? Not for little old me in Saskatchewan here. That doesn't really apply to me, right? Or is this, is this a reality that's, or a, a possibility for all of us as believers in Christ? Absolutely it is, because we have the same Holy Spirit, don't we? Keep going. So why the filling? What does this mean? I, I like this illustration, and I think it helps bring a little bit of clarity to this. You know, uh, I, I don't know if you've ever stayed, in it, probably stayed at someone's house for a, a, a longer period of time, you know, not just for a night or two, but, you, you know, if you're at somebody's place, you're staying at somebody's place for a week or two or a, or a month, um, you kind, of, you kind of start, you know, as you come into this place, you kind of start off small. You know, okay, well, you know, welcome here, come in, uh, you know, so you sit down in the sitting room or the living room or whatever, and, you know, you don't venture very far from there because, you know, you're just there, and so um, that's kind of, you know, uh, it for now in the first day or two, you know, you venture out a little bit, but, but as time goes on, um, and the host gives you permission. You know, make yourself at home here. Um, and as time, but as time goes on, you start to, you know, move a little further away. You start to, uh, you know, go and, and get your own food. You start to, you know, move around a little bit more freely. But at, at first, you're, you're, you know, when you first get there and you're, you're just kind of staying in that one little, ro that one little room or whatever it is, uh, you're not venturing too far away, you're still 100% in that house, right? But as, as a guest, and, that, and over time it changes. You become like a member of the family. You start to you know, go in the fridge. You make your own food, and, and you leave your own mess on the counter <laughs> and those things. And, and you, you start to become at home. And, but you're still, just like you were 100% at home when you first came in the door, but now things are changing, right? The same is true for God the Holy Spirit. He came to dwell fully when, when we... When we came humbly by repentance and faith in Christ, He came to dwell fully in us. See, you know, He wasn't just taking up 49% uh, you know, or something like that. He came 100% to indwell us at our rescue at the moment that we became a believer. But we, we have to allow Him the freedom to empower and to transform the rest of us. You know, it's the same way as, as uh, you know, He comes in. And, and, and this is kind of His room. But we must allow Him the freedom to empower us, to transform the rest of us. You know, to transform our thinking. Transform our attitudes. And slowly but surely, we, we give our, our attitudes over. Our thinking, our appetites, our hobbies, and relationships. Remember, God is he's such a gentle man, such a gentleman. He, he only rescued us. When did He rescue us? When we humbly came and repented and we trusted Christ. And, and it's the same way as, as He transforms us and empowers us as we humble ourselves and admit our need in every area of our lives, He continues to transform us. This happens as we humble ourselves in repentance and faith in every area of our life. 
So stop and think about this for a second. Let's compare the, um, the early church with the Israelites, their forefathers, when they came out of, when they came out of Egypt. Remember back in, in 101 we talked about they came out of Egypt, they came all the way up to Canaan the first time, and did they enter Canaan right away? No, there was 40 years of wandering, right? So think about this. So God displayed his power both then and now. Like think of what God is doing in the early church. Okay, so the difference here, but why did the early church overcome and not their forefathers? Why the difference? Why the difference? Both then and for the early church, they both saw the display of God's power, right? So why did their forefathers not overcome, but here the early church is? What's the difference? What's the difference? Yeah, the indwelling Holy Spirit, right? That's a big, that's a huge difference. What else? What else is the difference? Yes. Yes. They, they, they didn't know who their God really was, but the early church, they knew who their God is? And so there's the, there's the key difference right there. The early church had an intimate relationship with God, and so they could go forward trusting in God like Caleb and Joshua did. They knew that nothing or no one could thwart God's plans. So as believers, we're going to face persecution like Christ in the early church. And I think, believe it or not, we're seeing the handwriting coming down through the news, aren't we? That the day is coming when it's going to get tougher for us to live openly as a believer in Jesus Christ. And so we need to develop, we now, we need to be developing a theology that's going to handle persecution. Because whether we like it or not, it's going to get tougher. So the question is, how will we respond? And so if you flip to this next one, here's the question. Does trouble drive us together as believers, or does it separate us? It should drive us together, right? Because the level of our, the level of our authentic faith, it's going to unite us in, in, in united prayer. Do we spend our time complaining, looking for injustice or an escape, or do we unite and concentrate it, God-honoring prayer? In the flesh, how would we respond? looking for escape, right? Looking for justice. Give me justice. But guess what? Authentic faith unites in actually looking to God to provide. Does our, does our prayer look like, um, does, does our prayer look like, what does our prayer, me, what does our prayer look like during overwhelming circumstances and trial? Is it God-focused or us-focused? Is it faith-filled or fear-filled? Take a moment to consider where are we at. Because we need to be prepared, don't we? How are we going to respond? Do we know who our God is? Because the level that we know who our God is is the level that we're going to respond in confidence in Him. Keep going. Lost you. Prayer should be our holy reflex to persecution. In prayer, we submit everything to God as he, as, to do as He purposes, regardless of the cost. See, prayer is not, and we know this, prayer is not manipulating God to get what I want. Actually, prayer is our submitting to and dependence upon Him to go forward and do as He purposes. We admit we exist for God. We are helpless. We're helpless to overcome fear of our own, and we ask God to change our hearts, don't we? And God is there to beat us up in this process. Or is he there to transform us? In this process, we get to know our God and our faith continues to grow, doesn't it? See, persecution is good, right? I remember amongst the Mangan Mangan believers as we were teaching through some of these truths and we're talking about persecution is good. So I said, just joking, I said, maybe we should pray for some persecution, eh? They said, ah, I don't think so. And God never encourages us to pray for persecution. But you know, when persecution did come for the, the believers, it caused them to grow like crazy because they knew who their God was. Prayer is getting into deep communion with God. I tell him what I know he knows in order that I might get to know it as he does. Oswald Chambers. So we can't live the Christian life alone. We need each other. We need the Holy Spirit. Just having a conversation today with someone, and as they walked along the journey of addiction and, and now walking in victory, one of, the, one of the first things, what did you do in those, the question was asked, Dan asked this question, 
you know, what did you do in the early days to make sure that you stayed on track, that you didn't go resort back into the old life? And it was about being with people, being in community. I don't go anywhere by myself. I don't drive by myself. I rely on other people. That, that's what we, we need to be like. We need, to, we need each other. We need to realize that, that we need each other so much. We need the Holy Spirit. In the early church, they got this. This is why they experienced this level of prayer, of unity and prayer. And this is why God's Spirit works so powerfully in and through them. They understood the need for each other. Man, our world teaches, and, and, and everywhere you look, it's, it's teaching us to be alone, to be separate, be your own person, go your own way. And in fact, that's what addiction uh, does. It, you know, they, they, this person shared, you know, that's what it, you know, it drives you to be alone. You don't want to be with other people. You want to be alone in your own wretchedness, basically. But after coming out of that, walking in victory, now there's this sense of, I need to be with people. I need to be and immerse themselves in Bible studies, in the Word of God, and, and in prayer. Why? Because they know and, and, and understand the effects of, of the, the result of not walking that way, not living in community, not living in fellowship, and walking without. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 18, and go to verse uh, 19, and we'll read verse 19 and 20. Matthew 18, and in verse 19 and 20. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered, for, sorry, for where two or three gather in my name, there I'm with them. So it says here, it says here where two or three, um, no, that's not it, right? Uh, what does it mean to agree with each other? Again, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about it, what does that mean? If you agree on something together. What's involved with two people agreeing? Unity. Mm -hmm. Unity. What does that mean that w if you and I were, were agreeing with each other, there's a level of respect, there's a level of listening, there's a level of submitting um, to the wish of, wishes of God and each other. That, that's what true unity is. You know, agreeing with each other, respecting each other. Um, and, and that's what unity is. It's about, it, it's not about us. It's not about our agenda. It's, it's about God. And together, when, when you talk about agreeing, together we agree or we desire God to, uh, to be glorified and His kingdom to advance. That's what we agree on. That God is glorified. That He is lifted up. But it can be messy at times, right? It can be really messy at times. But, but what, could, what does God promise as a result of this unity? What, is it, what does He promise... Uh, as a result of agreeing together. Go, go to the end of the verse, uh, verse 20. He will be with us. There and I'm with you. He doesn't leave us alone, right? In verse, end of verse 19. It will be done for you. He will do it. He doesn't leave us, and He will do it. So here's a question. Why, why is it important and necessary for believers to agree together in order for God to bless? Why is unity so important in order for God to, to, do, to do what we're asking or what's needed? Why is it so important? What's at the heart of it? What's at the heart of unity that makes it so important? Humility. Thoughts? Sorry? Humility. Yeah, humility, absolutely. What else? The image of God, right? How, what, how is God's relationship defined between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Isn't there incredible unity? Incredible cohesion? And really, so, so guess what? So when, we, when there's a lack of unity with another brother, a brother or sister in Christ, what, it's sin against God because He's invited us into this unity that He enjoys in the Trinity. 
So now in John 17, 22, Jesus invites us into the unity that is enjoyed by the Trinity. And so in that sense, as believers, God is inviting us in to enjoy what the Trinity does, where we too are a single unit, working in total harmony. That's what He's designed us as a body of believers to work together in that complete harmony going forward. And while each believer has different roles or functions, our roles are supposed to fit, connect, overlap, and complement the functions of another believer. This is the unity that God's inviting us into, and we see that through the character of God as we, go, as we go forward and understand who He is. So the question is, how is this level of unity possible? How, how is it possible for me to have this level of unity with my brother or my sister? What do I need to recognize? I need to recognize that they're created in God's image, right? I need to recognize that I need them, that they're essential for my walk as a believer. God's brought me into a body where they're a part of what I've now been brought into. And they're indwelt by the Spirit of God and and, and essential and and necessary in going forward. We are one in Christ. This This is true regardless of race, regardless of background, regardless of quirks regardless of faults. And sometimes we live in a large church, don't we? We live in a large church, and we can live in our own little corner where we don't have to associate with every believer that we may not necessarily get along with. But the reality is that an authentic faith does what? It unites. And we need to recognize the necessity and actually the evidence of what an authentic faith really looks like. This unity begins with us, doesn't it? doesn't begin with others. That's why I like the verse in Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. We desire God to bless, then we need to honor Him and His Word. And this is one of those key areas. Authentic faith unites in God-focused prayer. I don't know if you've seen, have you seen this, uh, this uh, cartoon, as it were, how we need each other. And it's very simple, but uh, the acronym is TEAM. Together, everyone accomplishes accomplishes more and uh, recognizing it. But our culture teaches the complete opposite, doesn't it? But, but this, no, also, this is one way that, uh, that God or our Lord Jesus will continue to build His church when mm. there's total unity like that. Yeah, absolutely. Why would unbelievers ever want to come be a part of a body of believers where there's, where there's infighting and there's friction and, and all of that? Because, again, there's nothing authentic there either because they get that in the world already. Most homes, are, most homes are dysfunctional. Why would they want to come and be part of a group that's also dysfunctional? So this is a reality where as we as believers need to live, isn't it? We need God to transform us. Any thoughts or questions on this point? You guys are awful quiet tonight. So as much as lies within you, live at peace. And then, live at peace yeah. as best you can. Mm-hmm. And, and yes, you recognize that there's no believers, so you work together as best you can. But and then there's math. It's always going to be a little of this unless you search yourself to make sure you're not at fault somehow mm-hmm. or that you have. And then you pray again. Yeah. Because it doesn't, it's not always, it won't always be, and you will not always be. Yeah. And that's where it's messy, and that's just the relationship that God's brought us into. But that's where you have Matthew 18 to bring about that. That's where we're part of a body to walk, walk through those things, and we'll look at that as we're going forward. But yes, it is going to get bumped. And as we go along on these lessons, there's going to be the divide culturally as the Gentiles actually come into the church and the prejudice, the prejudice that's there and all of this messiness. But the reality is, to the level that we know who our God is, is that level that we continue to submit to Him and submit to His Word regardless. But if every believer continues to grow at that level then that helps to navigate some of that messiness going forward. And if you're, if you're a stronger believer or, or more mature, you should be reaching back and helping yeah. as much as you can. The other yeah. 
and we forego our rights. We forego what we have every right to, to demand as well. And there's another biblical principle of submitting and, and humbling ourselves and, and, and bearing faults and all of that as we will see as we go forward in God's Word. Good point. Thank you. But this is where it's messy. This is where we need each other. But if we come to the, we come to the friction knowing that I need my brother, that the Spirit of God indwells them, then that influences how we address them, how we walk into the problem too, right? Absolutely. Because this is, yeah. this is where this unity is so important. This unity and this bond together is of greater importance than me being right or you being wrong. Like this is bigger than that. This is bigger than you or I, right? that's why it's so important we talk about that and I, I don't know i can't remember where that verse is found but you, you know as you came to faith in humility walk, so walk in you know continue on this is this is how you came to christ this is how you live in christ because if we don't that, that's where that that's where that rub comes in is we don't then it's just my way or the highway and we're not willing to do everything that we can you know if it depends on us you know do what we can to live in peace now does that mean bending over and folding over and allow people to people to walk over us no but do what we can yeah, you get my way. Yeah. Number two, authentic faith unites, and how does it do so? In radical, selfless, holy lives. And I think this kind of speaks to and, and carries on for that conversation we were just having, John. Uh, I think that, that speaks into that as well. So as we continue to read, we will see more evidence of the, of the believer's authentic faith, that this reality, this that, that they lived out every day in the early church. So let's go back to Acts chapter 4. Acts good. chapter 4, and let's read um, verse 32 to 37. The believers share their possessions. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that, they were, that there were no needy persons among them. From time, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it in, at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had needs. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field, and he bought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So how do we see the unity of the believers uh, in, in, this, in this passage of Scripture, in these verses? How do we see that? that was, that's, I didn't have a slide. You need a slide on that. What's that? I didn't include a slide, sorry. You didn't? Okay. No. No, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, so so they're, they're one heart and one mind. There was complete unity in everything. One heart, one mind. Complete freedom for anyone to use their things. No one claimed his, you know, this, this is hard. This is mine. How, you know, where, where do we learn that? Man, mine. That, that's, an early, that's an early thing that we, you know, mine, mine. But complete freedom for anyone to use their things. That's crazy. Bill, when your 55 Chevy is fixed, you know, what do you do with that? Can anyone use that 55 Chevy? You can. <laughs> yeah, you're... So, so, but, but, you know, those are the things. How do we do that? Things that are precious to us. But, but no one claims any of his possessions as their own. That's, it. That's crazy. Complete power in proclaiming the truth. You know, with great power, the apostles continued to testify about the Lord. Complete love and openness and aware of each other's needs. Isn't that interesting? They were aware, they were aware of each other's needs. There was no needy person among them. 
complete unity, leadership and integrity in the, in the distribution of donations. You know, what did they do? They had extra. They, they saw a need, and what did they do? They, they, they came and they brought it and they put it at the apostles' feet. Well, well, e even today, all that we have belongs to God. It does. He, he's the giver of all things, whether we're yeah. farming, whether we are at work, or whatever we do. It should mm. all belong to God, right? Yeah. And we shouldn't hang on it to it tightly. We should be willing to <laughs> share with the need, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so what was the result? As we go back to verse 33, what is the result here? Here's verse 33. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. What was the result? Yeah, they got more power to do what? what? What does it say here? To, yeah, to testify about the resurrection. To talk about what, you know, what's going on. To share the gospel. To, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, and God's, God's grace. God's favor. You, you know, he rested on all of them as they did, as they did this. God, God blessed them because of their faith. Their unity was created uh, you know, their unity created incredible, like radical giving. This is what I call radical giving. You know, should I give 10%? Seems like a lot. Look at verse 34. That there were no needy persons among them for, listen to this, for from time to time, what did they do? Those who owned land or houses sold them brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. That is radical giving. But, but it's not about becoming, you know, they weren't socialists or communists. Okay, well, sell everything you have and now we give it here and we'll, we'll do with it what we can. No, it wasn't. The apostles, and, and the apostles weren't forcing them. This wasn't the preaching or teaching of the apostles. You must, you know, that's not where they're teaching. You must Bring all your stuff. Sell all your goods. Bring it in here. And we will do with it what we see. That wasn't going on. They weren't teaching about that at all. And yet on their own from time to time. And so this isn't saying that everybody had to sell everything. But from time to time, those who owned land sold them and gave to others. It continues on in Acts chapter 5. Can somebody read Acts 5, 1 to 11? Jake, do you want to read that for me, please? Verses 1 to 11 of Acts chapter 5. Her 
So what's your first thoughts as you hear this account? It's not the first time we've heard this, but as you take it in, what comes to mind? Pretty graphic, isn't it? Can you imagine what that would look like here in our midst? And did God immediately strike Ananias and Sapphira? Boom. Is that instantaneous? Is that instantaneous judgment? Or what did God allow for Ananias and Sapphira here? Mm -hmm. And when they chose not to, that's when he judged, right? So was God being fair to these new believers? They're only, they're only believers of, of, a, of a few years probably at this point in time, but was God being fair? Or is a better question, was God being just? He's always just, right? He is absolute owner and ruler over us. Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira's faith, was it authentic? Was it holy or was there sin involved? There was sin involved, wasn't there? It was an affront to God. God is holy and all sin is against Him. And this would have been a warning to, the, to that early church. But this is, who the, this is the God, how absolutely holy He is. So just remember again, this isn't, this isn't just some small, tiny church. This is what we refer to as a mega church. One of the, you know, it was thousands strong. But here is how they uh, could be so reunited in such a you know, radical and selfless way. Their faith was authentic. It completely changed them. Their faith in, in God, it completely changed who they were. Their, their everything, their core values, their thoughts, their belief system, everything. They believed that God would provide for all of their needs. They totally believed that. Man, sometimes when I pray for God to, to meet all of my needs, sometimes I don't... I mean, I'm ashamed to say it in front of you, but I don't believe sometimes that He's going to provide for all my needs. I've got to put something in. But the, you know, that's, they, they had such radical belief. They had such radical faith. Their view of God was right. He was their sovereign ruler with a final say over everything. Their lives, their possessions. That's why they were willing, from time to time it says, that's why they were willing to sell some of their possessions because they had a right view of God. Their view of others was pure. They saw everything they did was to, um, was to live Christ and promote Him to all unbelievers. So everything they did, that was the purpose. Their motives were, was holy. They went from selfish ambition to selfless glorification of God. That was what it was about. It wasn't about them. It was, an, it was all about God. God the Holy Spirit was transforming their lives from the inside out. He was changing everything who they were. He began to transfer His holiness into every area of their life, every part of their life. The holiness of God within their hearts began to, to shine out of, of all of their thinking, all of their motives, everything that they did, uh, you know, everything that their attitudes, all of their attitudes were a result of God's holiness shining out of every area and every aspect of their life. All of their actions, this began to transfer, uh, transform their natural bent towards pride. It transformed their, their natural bent towards greed or selflessness, uh, or selfishness and, and lying or cheating. And as a result, it's not, wow, look at these wonderful believers. They were amazing. These were some amazing people. But it's, it's rather, well, look at the power of God at work in the believers in all of their lives. This is what God did. He transformed this. Can you go back to the previous slide a second? Just as you're thinking there, I think we need to change this back a little bit. These are new believers. This was a process that was beginning. To say it was complete, and we, we saw that earlier. John, you mentioned that earlier. There was a process where God was beginning to change them. And so we need to dial this back just a little bit, but, but to reference it. These are new believers still figuring this story out and, um, and try, trying to understand it. But there was an understanding of who their God was, and they were responding to the truth that they had at that point in time as God continued to transform them. If we were to use an illustration to, of, of our acceptance with God and how that affects how we live, think of a child that comes into a loving family. 
As that child comes into a loving family, they suddenly belong, don't they? Nothing will ever change their position within that particular family. And so as a response up to that what, is that, what does that girl begin to try to do? To live out, to live out the ideals of the family, seeking to uphold the honor um, and the ideals of her family and doing nothing to bring shame or dishonor to her family. Isn't that the same for us as believers? As we, understand, as we understand all that Christ did for us and who He is, does that not lead to this radical selfless as a result of what He has done, as we understand and appreciate who He is in our lives? We forever belong as God's child, and as a result, we choose to live out the ideals of our family and uphold the honor of the one who rescued us, the head of our family. God is the one who rescued us. We belong to Him. We are no longer our own. Who do we represent? We represent Christ, don't we? And my actions as I go forward represents every other believer in, 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 within my particular family as well. And so there's that unity and that connection as we understand it going forward. So just to think about it and reflect a little bit on how God dealt with Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira. Was this new, the way he dealt with them? Was this something that new that happened? Or uh, did God also respond you know, in the same way in the past? Have we seen this? Have we gone through 101 and 102? And, and ha, ha, you know, have we seen this response before? And if so, who? Where? With Korah and his followers. With Korah and his followers? The ground opened up. Uh huh. Where else? So we go back as, as we look at these pictures. Aaron. Aaron? Mm -hmm. Yep. Lucifer? Adam and Eve? Cain? We, we've seen this before, right? The same is true for, yeah, and you, uh, somebody mentioned that. Aaron's sons? You know, soon after they became priests in the tabernacle, they defied God and were judged because of their sin. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, uh, if you want, you can turn here, but I'm going to read uh, Leviticus 10, 1 to 3. Actually, turn there. Leviticus 10, 1 to 3. It's okay to take time to read God's Word. It's important. Here we see exactly the same, the same thing happened. God is dealing, uh, God dealt with, we, we, you know, He deals with everybody the same. He's consistent. Leviticus 10, 1 to 3. Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu took their censers, put fire to them, and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to His command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me, I will be proved holy in the sight of all people. I will be honored. And Aaron remained silent. Aaron's two sons, they knew very well how to approach God. But what did they do? They, they knew exactly, this is the way that you approach God. But what did they do? They did exactly the opposite. They, they, they decided to go on their own way, their own thing. No, you know, we can do this on our own, right? But why did God judge them in this way? Why so harshly? That's harsh, God. Isn't it? Why would He judge them so harshly? They could, that's, that's crazy stuff, right? Fire comes down. Because God is absolutely holy. I mean, is it almost when it's something that will mislead and direct others to be faith that one? Because if that will let them let go, before us, that cold wax, it would have almost been a slap in the face of God. It would have given his name and say what he's too. 
But that's where, God is, that's where God is supreme too. He's the one that makes those decisions. And ultimately one day, all of, all of it's going to be, to be made right. All of it's going to be dealt with. And so we get these examples through his word. And it's, a, it's an alert to us as believers that guess what? We think that we can get away with things. Okay, I'm not being judged, but guess what? There is a time of reckoning coming because God is absolutely holy. Absolutely. Yes, Achan too. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The New Living Translation says, I will display my holiness through those who come near me. I will display my glory before all the people or in the sight of all people. I will be honored. And so anything besides that is dishonoring to God. This is exactly what, what God was declaring to, to the early believers uh, through Ananias. Ananias. Man, uh, Ananias. Ananias. <laughs> Okay, and, and these two people. God, God is absolutely holy, and those who present Him must hold God in high you know, esteem by the way they reflect Him. We, we are a reflection of who God is. And if, we're, you know, if we're, and if we're exemplifying, if we're reflecting a holy God, you can't... This is not a holy God. That what they were doing wasn't the reflection of a holy God at all. And the early church got it. And great fear, seized, uh, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events, Acts 5.11. So the early church, they understood the necessity of holiness. They understood the necessity going forward. Notice Acts chapter 4, verse 33, and what it says, And with great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. So just flip forward. Notice this. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. And much grace was upon them all. NIV. Um, great grace was upon them all. And God's great blessing was upon them all. Uh, great grace, God's remarkable loving kindness and favor and goodwill rested richly upon them. Why? Because they were, because of their authentic faith. Therefore, they demanded that God would bless. Is this a manipulating as they lived authentically? So therefore, then God had to do this? Is that how, is that how it works? Is that what grace means? What's grace mean? What's the definition of grace? Getting what, we don't Getting what we don't deserve. Because they didn't deserve this. They didn't earn this. This was God's grace in their lives. God's grace is unmerited and boundless favor. It originates with God. We contribute nothing nor, nor, nor owe anything in return. Grace is one way love. And so this was God's working going forward in their lives. So God's grace, does this mean, does this mean an easy life for these early believers? God's grace rested on them, so everything went smooth. Everything was rosy, right? Is that what it meant? No, no persecution? Yeah, that's why they're in jail. <laughs> yeah, that's why they're in jail, right? God's grace was there and was present, enabling them going forward in all of that, endure, to endure that. Now for us, what's, um, how authentic is our faith? We've been believers for a lot of years. Where's, where am I at? How authentic is my faith? Now, this is not about doing more or trying harder. All that we have is because of God's grace, His unmerited and boundless favor. How am I responding to that? Where are we at in our walk with the Lord? We desire God's blessing, don't we? We desire, we desire His working through us. We need to live, ra we need to live this, this radical um, life. And so think about this. This is a chance for us to humble ourselves. So here's some questions as we go forward and flip it. So flip this forward. Is there a difference between our private lives and our church lives? Where are we at? Again, this is not about doing better, trying harder. This is about an opportunity to say, God, I need you. I need your grace. Do we have complete unity with every believer as much as lies within us? Where are we at with our relationships with each other? This is authentic faith. This is what it looks like when we bring it when the rubber meets the road. Have we owned, have we owned our part in every conflict and sought to make it right? Again, it's not about changing the other person. It's about owning our portion of it. As much as lies within in me, live at peace with all men. Where do we need to forgive regardless of the other person's response or actions? How authentic is our faith? Where am I at? Again, I'm not earning God's favor. I'm not manipulating God. This is my response. 
to what he's done. Where are we at? Again, you don't have to speak out openly. Go next one. So how do we view our stuff? Does God own it or do we own it? Yeah, we're, we talked about it earlier, right? We're, we're to steward our things, but how tightly do we hold on to it? Is our stuff more important than people knowing Christ? How quick are we to give help? With no strings attached. How willing are we to meet the needs of others? When it includes time, maybe money, or some of our possessions and so on? How open are we to share our needs? How free are we to, sh- you know, to receive help? That, that's hard, too. It's hard to receive help. How authentic and transparent is our leadership in those that handle public money? What comes to mind as you think of authentic faith at this level, when it, when it meets our everyday life? What comes to mind? Is it scary? Does it seem a little too radical? This isn't for everyone. That's a little over the top, I would say. Right? Does it seem too radical? Why do we we push back from this type of faith? Why does that seem to rub the wrong way. Where's the disconnect? Is it sin? Is it a wrong view of God? Is it neglecting to yield to God's Word and the Holy Spirit? And that's tough. When I... When I I'm, I'm, not just, I'm not just saying this to... This is, this is speaking to me. What, what sin do I need to confess to God? Where do I need to forgive? And what do I need to make right? We have to remember that all of us, every believer, we are a, bought, a blood-bought son or daughter of the Almighty King of God. All of our sin, past, present, and future has been dealt with. And this is you know, nothing can separate us from God. We, we forever belong. So there should be that complete acceptance of every believer and that freedom to be transparent as we, for, as we figure out life as a believer. Because authentic faith, it unites in radical ways, in radical behaviors. In radical love, in radical grace, in radical giving, authentic faith unites and causes us to be selfless. Authentic faith unites and causes us to live holy lives. Yeah, we, we're, we're, we're not there yet as, as God is holy, but it's a process. It's ongoing, right? And so isn't it interesting where authentic faith unites? Can we, can we do this on our own? Can we walk this out ourselves? So where's our relationships like with each other to be able to challenge each other, to speak openly about these Mm -hmm. things? Are we open enough with another fellow believer or sister in Christ to be able to talk at this level? Because we're not going to do it on our own. It's very easy to sit comfortably in our corner, in our house, and do it with our things. It's easy to give excuses for disunity, isn't it? Let's, Let's conclude here. Remember the opening illustration of the manager of the tightrope walker walking across that, uh, that Niagara Falls? His faith was authentic. He put everything on the line. And as believers in Christ, um, as believers in Christ, we are that manager, but we didn't get on the back of a mere man, did we? We got on the back of Christ. And he's not, Christ isn't just walking us over a 1,300 foot a, a swaying rope across Niagara Falls. Where is Christ taking us? across the tightrope of this life and into eternity, isn't he? 
Our faith is in Christ. Our faith in Christ is all in for our entire lives. And Jesus tells us the same thing that that tightrope walker told his manager. Look up at me, not at the swaying rope of life, not the winds of adversity or the space below. You and your aspirations, your dreams and plans, now take a back seat. You are one with me, spirit and soul, mind, emotions and will. Release yourself totally into my hands to carry you as only I know how. If I sway, sway with me. Do not attempt to balance yourself. And see, so we need to view ourselves. On, we're, not on, we're not an island unto ourselves. We're walking with Christ through this life. Now think about that. That manager got on the back of, of that tightrope walker, complete confidence. Whose back did we get on? We got on the back of Christ, didn't we? Is, is, can we trust him? Even when God asks us to walk into an authentic faith that seems radical, that seems beyond everything that the world teaches us, can we choose to live radically at that level? Are we alone in this journey? Is Christ not there with us, carrying us? Is He not sufficient? Did He not meet our greatest need at the cross? And can He not meet my everyday need walking forward? So the question is, will we trust him? Will we take him at his word in walking this forward? It's not faith in faith. It's faith in Christ. You know, everything that we have, everything that, you know, it's all bound up in the person of Jesus Christ. Let me, do we have time for this? Yeah, we do. I'm just going to read the following excerpt uh, from A.B. Simpson entitled Himself. Uh, I don't know if we have printouts, but we can get you printouts if you want to see this. Uh, you can Google it as well. There's some and articles here. These, you have some there? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and it, and, it's, and it's, a really power, it's really powerful. Let me read. I wish to speak to you about Jesus and Jesus only. I went to meetings and heard people speak of joy. I even thought I had joy, but I I did not keep it because I had not myself as my joy. Not himself. What's that, sorry? Not have himself as your joy. Oh, I, I had not himself as my joy. He at last said to me, oh so tenderly, my child, just take me and let me be in you the constant supply of all this, myself. And then I, and then, sorry, and when I thus saw him, it was such rest. It was all right and right forever, for I had not only what I could hold that little hour, but also in him all that I should need, the next and the next, and, and so on. And now, thank God, I have him not only what I have room for, but that which I have not room for, but for which I shall have room moment by moment. I am like the little bottle in the sea, as full as it was as full as it will hold. The bottle is in the sea, and the sea is in the bottle, so I am in Christ, Christ is in me. But besides that bottle full in the sea, there is a whole ocean beyond. The difference is that the bottle has to be filled over again, every day, every more, ever more. And then there's a song they put, put out himself, once it was the blessing, now it is the Lord. Once it was a feeling, now it is his word. Once his gifts I wanted, now the giver own. Once I sought for healing, now himself alone. Once this painful trying, now now tis perfect trust. Once a half salvation, now the uttermost. Once a a ceaseless holding, now he holds me fast. Once this constant drifting, now my anchors cast. Once it was my working, his his it hence shall be once i tried to use him now he uses me once the power i wanted now the mighty one once for self i labored now for him alone once i hoped in jesus now i know he's mine once my lamps were dying now they brightly shine once for death i waited now his coming hail and my hopes and my hopes are anchored safe within the veil powerful isn't it himself it's actually a song that he wrote. There's music that goes with it if you're musically inclined. But this is where authentic faith, it's all centered in Christ. 
And that's where we want to have a big view of Christ, isn't it? Because to the level that we know who our Savior is, is the level that we're going to trust Him. See, He was our deliverer for our past, but is He also our deliverer for today? Absolutely. And where He's taking us is authentic faith. <coughs> authentic faith that's going to unite in God-focused prayer. It's going to unite in radical, selfless, holy lives. That's the work that He's doing in us. And that's what we need to be praying about. That's what we need to be asking Him for. Like this quote here. If you be a Christian, this is from Spurgeon, if you be a Christian, be a, if you be a Christian, be a Christian and be a marked and distinct one. Because mm. that's what the world needs. Thoughts or questions, comments? Challenge? Some rub? Some conviction? Should be, isn't there? What truth are you going to take with you tonight? What truth are you going to take with you tonight? Isn't that where we get ourselves in trouble? What truth are we taking with us tonight? Christ alone. Christ alone. How thankful are we that we have Christ alone? 